2020, our theme for this year and our opening series is, is 2020 Vision. Last week, you'll remember, we looked at Habakkuk chapter 2, and we saw the importance of believers having a vision. We looked at, we referenced, rather, Proverbs 29, 18, which says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Last week, we saw that the difference between prospering and perishing spiritually is having a vision. And then we're going to look at this topic of vision from a little bit different viewpoint, and we're going to look at God's vision for his church. If you find Matthew chapter 16 in your Bibles, that's where we'll be reading from today. And if you'll put a bookmark or a pen over in Zechariah chapter 9. I'm going to be referencing mostly Zechariah chapter 9. But before we get there, there's a truth contained in Matthew chapter 16 that we need to establish as our foundation, first and foremost. So if you found Matthew chapter 16 in your Bibles, if you'll stand, please, on the honor of reading God's word. We're going to start in verse 13 and read down to verse 18. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they say, Some say that I were John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today humble, but very blessed by the very yes, that you would want to meet with us. Amen. Lord, I thank you for those that are here today. I pray for your blessing on each individual here and each family represented. Yes. Lord, we pray for the children that are downstairs that are going to be yes. hearing from your word while we're Amen. discussing your words upstairs. I pray that you'll be with their teacher to give them the words to explain your, the, the Bible in ways those children can understand. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here today in your house, young, old, child or adult, not yet, except you as their, as their Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. Yes. Lord, now as we think about vision, Lord, help us be a people of vision. Wow. Help us be a, a church of vision. <coughs> but Lord, as we develop our vision, let's condition our hearts to make sure that we are focused on what you want from us, and not just what we want for ourselves. Lord, as always, nobody needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. Yes. So I ask you to speak. Help us be ready to listen and respond to your word. We pray all these things in the perfect, precious, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. Like I mentioned, I'm going to be preaching mostly from the text in the book of Zechariah. But before we turn over there, as we consider God's vision for the church, before we consider God's vision for this church, we need to be reminded of whose church it is in the first place. We need to be reminded of who is in control here. We need to be reminded of who is in charge. We need to be reminded that the church is to be governed by God. If you're following along, there's an outline on the back of your bulletin if you'd like to take notes. And the first thing we see is that the church is to be governed by God. In verse 18, we see one word, a single word, with two, liter uh, two letters. But if we miss it, if we skip over it, if we disregard this one word, we will never be the church that God wants us to be. In verse 18, Jesus says, I will build my church. If you'll say that with me, Jesus said, I will build my church. I want you to go ahead and stand up for a minute. I'm going to come down here. This is for me. If you'd stand real, really, really quickly. I want you to say this with me, if you would. This is not my church. This is not my church. But you can take your seats real quick. We're done for the day. We'll see you guys next week. There you go. <laughs> now, if you think that's a silly exercise, let me just say, there are a lot of Christians who haven't quite figured out the church isn't about them. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of pastors who haven't quite figured out it's not their church. There are entire churches who seem to misunderstand that they themselves are not the authority. 
The church is not about them. It's not about their wants. It's not about their wishes or their desires. It's not about what they want for themselves. Church is about what God wants from them for himself. In Psalm chapter 127, it says, Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. In other words, as a church, if we're trying to go about the business of serving the Lord, but doing it how we want to do it, if we're trying to reach people the ways that we feel comfortable doing it, if we're trying to grow spiritually or numerically or any other way that we prefer and ways that we choose, God says it's empty. It's pointless. Yes. All that effort is completely useless. When we see here in verse 18, when God says that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now understand that he is talking here about the church universal. Now there are times in the Bible when, when God speaks about the church in the entirety of God's kingdom. Almost with like a capital C in church. That's referring to the entirety of all believers across the world. Not just Christians here in America, but Christians in, in Africa and Asia and Europe from time past into, until, etern until eternity future. But the Bible also talks about the little C church, the local called out assembly of believers. And when we read this statement, when Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's normal to ask then, why are so many churches closing? Around 30,000 churches closed between years 2012 and 2018. That's approximately 5,000 churches a year. Hmm. Now without making statements about churches that we don't know anything about, we can venture some, some probable reasons based on what we saw last week and what we just read. We saw last week where the Bible tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. Okay. Last week we saw that where there is no vision, people perish. And make no mistake about it, a church with no vision will die. We mentioned a couple months ago when we looked at the church at Laodicea. A lot of churches are dead, they just don't realize it. <laughs> Churches that have seen declining attendance over three years but haven't reached new people to replace those that are no longer coming are in a serious area of decline. And when that happens over the course of many years, the church might feel like they're still alive because they're still having services. But if they're not reaching people with the gospel, they're not baptizing people, they're not seeing people grow in their walk with the Lord, they're not really alive. A church that does not have a vision for reaching people, a church that doesn't have a plan for sharing the gospel, a church that doesn't have a plan for growth will perish. Mm -hmm. And the other reason, in addition to lack of vision, is what we just read about. Churches have lost sight of, of who's really in control of them. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> the Christian church can never be defeated or overcome, but it can lose the blessings. Mm -hmm. The church can miss out on being sustained and maintained and preserved by God. Now, there's many reasons for why that might happen. God may discipline a church or an individual in order to bring them back closer to him, to bring them to repentance. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, it says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He says he will build his church. But when churches lose sight of who they belong to, who they are ultimately going to give an account to, they're not guaranteed to be sustained or maintained or preserved. That's why it's so important for churches to remember who they belong to. The churches that are sold out for Christ and completely focused on him, those are the churches that won't fail. But the churches that are focused on themselves, their own ideas, their own objectives, their own personal preferences, they don't have the assurance from God that they won't fail. That's why the title of today's message, if you notice, it says God, God's vision for his church. It's a reminder that although we are an independent and autonomous church, we are not our own. Right. We as a church belong to somebody, and we belong to God. Yes. Now keeping that in mind, as a church we belong to God, let's turn over to Zechariah chapter 9, and we'll see what God's vision for his church is. I mentioned before that I love studying the minor prophets. In my own personal devotions, I'm in Amos right now, at least in the, the Old Testament portion of my reading. But Zechariah might be my favorite of the Old Testament prophets. Zechariah is one of these prophets who envisions a glorious future for the church. He uses the imagery of restoration and expansion and prospering when he prophesies about what God wanted to do both in and through the church, through his people. 
In verses 16 and 17 of Zechariah chapter 9, we see our first point about God's vision for his church. Verse 16 says, And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. For how great is his goodness, and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful, and new wine the maids. What we see here is that God's vision for his church is for the church to be a living witness to the goodness of God. And verse 16 says, they shall be the stones of a crown. What that refers to is those priceless, invaluable, prized, precious jewels set into a golden crown. Zechariah describes the church as being glorious, shiny, and exalted. It's something that is recognizable. It's something that is noticeable. It's something that is apparent and evident to anybody who's looking on. It literally means to catch someone's attention. So if we're going to look at this in biblical terms and put it in ways we can understand, as a church, we should be catching people's attention with, as we reflect the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. Once again, it refers to catching someone's attention. But here's the, here's the thing. We're not supposed to be drawing attention to, the self, to ourselves for the sake of building ourselves up. Verse 17 goes on and says, For how great is his goodness, how great is his beauty. Zechariah says that as a church, we should be shining spectacularly. Just as an ensign or a banner is raised up and draws people's attention to it. He says we should be shining so brightly as a testament to God's goodness. When people meet you, do they notice? Do you reflect the goodness of God? Is your life a living witness to how good God has been to you? When people think of you, do they think of a person who is just overcome with God's goodness and God's blessings in their lives? Or do they think of a person who goes to church, but gossips and complains like everybody else at work? Do they think of a person who claims to love God, but comes across as mostly impatient with other people that God has called us to love? When people look at your life, when people look at this church, do they see us reflecting the goodness of God? I want to think for a minute here. How much does your life draw other people's attention to the goodness of God? Is that the focus of your life? Is the focus of your life to draw attention to yourself? Or is the focus of your life to draw attention to God? Because nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that if we try to pump ourselves up, right. exalt ourselves, it doesn't tell us we're going to be blessed by God. Right. When we right. humble ourselves, God will exalt us. And as a church, when we humble ourselves and we try to reflect the goodness of God, that's when we will be exalted. Because if we're, if we're individuals who people don't see the goodness of God reflected in, we're not just going to walk through the doors of a church building and all of a sudden become a church that has this great witness of the goodness of God. That Christ's vision for, for the church was to be glorified, to be exalted, and shining. And this vision is consistent with what we see elsewhere in the prophets. In Micah chapter 4, verse 1, it says that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. Matthew 5, 13 says, ye are the light of the world. 1 Peter 2, 2, 10 says that we are a chosen generation called to show forth the praises of God, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Micah said that the, the church is established and exalted. Jesus said we are the light of the world. Peter said we are to show forth the praises of God. But do we as a church shine like a light in the midst of darkness? Now I know it's, it's bright in here, it's daytime. We won't try to turn off the lights and try to create it. But if we were to light a candle here at nighttime, if you, if you couldn't hear anything else, you couldn't see anything else, if it was pitch black outside, and we lit, we lit this candle, and we held it up here in front, where would the attention be drawn to? Yeah. Immediately to the light. Immediately to the light. No matter what else is going on, no matter what darkness people are dealing with, 
God says, when, when you are light of the world. You're to be drawing attention to that light. Are we doing that? Are we faithful in that? In a world that is filled with darkness, Jesus says, we as believers, we as a church, are the light of the world. Now notice, if you think about that in context here, and it's, it's an amazing thought that God would even use a church like ours anywhere. To, but he didn't say, you are the light of Bath, New York. He doesn't say, you're the light of the East Coast. He doesn't say, you are the light of America. He says, you are the light of the entire world. Are we shining like it? Are we drawing attention to God? It's good in a way that where the world is impacted by his people, not building themselves up, but reflecting the goodness of God and returning the glory to him. Are we doing that? Because that's what God's vision for his church is. He said, ye are the light of the world. Now, would we agree that the world is living in, in spiritual darkness? Yes. I don't think, I don't think we'd, we'd have any debate over that. But what happens if, if a church is actually shining for the Lord in, in, a, in an age of spiritual darkness, if there is a spiritual light shining, you know what happens? It's going to draw attention. People are going to notice it. People are going to recognize it. People are going to be aware of, it, of its existence. Light is noticeable. It's, it's recognizable. It draws attention. But as a church, are we shining? Are we reflecting? Are we exalting the goodness of God? And you say, well, how can we tell if we are? First and foremost, if people know we're here. If we exist in the community, and nobody in Bath knows where our church is, or we even exist, we're not shining. Hmm. Essentially what we're doing is that we're walking around with a candle unlit, holding the, the ability to shine light in a world that's already dark, and you know what we're doing? We're just contributing to the darkness. Hmm. Without doing anything to change it. That's not what God has called us to be. That's not what God has called us to do. If we're here, if we're located in this community, but we don't, people don't know that we're here, we're not, we're not shining the way that God wants us to. If we're here, but we're reflecting our own preferences, if we're focused on, like we talked about this morning during Sunday school, the Pharisees, who are only concerned about their own traditions, if that's what we're reflecting, we're not reflecting the goodness of God. Look at verse 17 again, if you would. As individuals and as a church, when people see us, when they think of us, is their first thought of the goodness of God? Or do they see some other characteristic in our life? Some personal trait that we have? Are people's first thoughts about you individually? Are people's first thoughts about this church? When they think about us, are their thoughts directed to the goodness of God or not? It's a yes or no question. There's no middle ground. We are either reflecting the goodness of God through our lives and through our ministry here at the church, or we're not. First Corinthians chapter 10 says that whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. Not to the glory of our own selves. When you come to this church, when you think about this church, are you focused on glorifying God or having your own preferences met? Does your focus reflect the goodness of God? or the desires of self. Uh, let me just ask you here, the second, the second week into a new year, has God been good to you in your life? No. Mm -hmm. Has God been good to this church? No. Verse 16 says here, because God has been good to us, because of the greatness of his goodness, it says that we are to shine like the stones of a crown, the precious jewels of a crown. But look at the, back, the last part of verse 16 with me. It says, lift it up as an incense. It's a picture here of the church being exalted, being lifted up. The beginning of the verse says, the Lord, sh the Lord their God shall save them. And the end of the verse says that God lifts them up. Do you want to be exalted by God? Do you want our church to be exalted by God? That we need to be reflecting the goodness of God. We need to have evidence. We need to be people that are marked by in evidence the reflecting of goodness of God in our lives. Otherwise, we're not going to be lifted up and exalted by God. Remember, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain to 
for trying to lift ourselves up by focusing on our own agenda or our, our own preferences, we're going to fail. But if we reflect the goodness of God, that's really our focus, not getting sidetracked by personal preferences that we might differ on. But if we are united in the goal of demonstrating the goodness of God, he says, to lift us up. In a very practical sense, if I were to ask Brother Bud to come forward, he's got his Bible in his hands. And he came up here and I said, hey, Bud, can I um, give you this, uh, the offering plate here, and then can you go over and pick up Miss Janet's bench there at the piano, or the organ? In a very practical sense, you know what he has to do before he can go pick up what he's been told to ask to pick up? He's got to set some other things down. He's got to let go of something. And as a church, if we're going to actually pick up the slack of what God tells us to do, to go pick up and be, reflect the goodness of God, if we're going to pick up other people and bring them to God, you know what we have to do? We have to drop some things. We don't let some things go. We don't let go of some personal preferences or, or th some things that I might prefer to focus on what God tells me to prefer. And what we see here is, is the text goes, as we reflect on the goodness of God, in order to do that, in order to, for some, as a church, in order for us to be lifted up, in order for us to be exalted, we have to set aside everything else that we're focused on that's keeping us from reflecting the goodness of God. There might be thoughts, there might be feelings, there might be traditions, as we saw in the Sunday school hour. There might be ways of doing things that we have to set down in order to focus on what God tells us is important, for us to focus on what God tells his vision is, which is to reflect the goodness of God of God. God. So actually see that God's vision for his church is not only to reflect the goodness of God, but also to demonstrate the greatness of God. To turn over just a page or two over to Zechariah chapter 10, the beginning of verse 6 it says, I will strengthen the house of Judah. The verse 7 says, they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man. So what we see here is that God intends for his people to be strong. What we see in these verses is a call to be like a mighty warrior. <coughs> You know, we, it, later in the, in the New Testament, it talks about, uh, it uses military terms about being under subjection and surrender to God as we follow his authority in our lives. And God's vision for his church is that of a great army fully focused on its mission. And God tells us over and over that we as individuals and we as a church are to be strong. Joshua 10.25 says, be strong and of good courage. 1 Chronicles 22.13, be strong and of good courage, dread not nor be dismayed. Uh, Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Ephesians 6, 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. God intends his people to be strong. Back in Proverbs 28, 19, we talked about where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 24, 10 says, it's all faint in the day of adversity, the strength is weak. My strength is small. People who are not strong in the Lord, churches that are not strong in the Lord, will not accomplish God's will for their lives. Let me ask you this very simple question. Does a spiritually weak Christian reflect the greatness of God? Does a person who isn't growing spiritually, is that person a testimony to the greatness of God? Let me ask you this. Do weak churches reflect the greatness of God? No. Why? God doesn't intend his people to be weak. He intends us to be strong. Right. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says that the church is intended to have an impression that wherever it exists, an impression of righteousness and the peace and the love of God. Very simply, weak churches don't have that type of impact. Weak churches don't have the impact that God wants them to have. So the first two points we've seen are focused on the church reflecting the characteristics of God. God's vision, vision for his church is to reflect the goodness of God, to demonstrate the greatness of God. And next we see a characteristic that God desires to be exhibited by his people. Very simply, God's people should be glad. We're still there in Zechariah chapter 10. If you look at verse 7 with me, First part of the verse we reference when speaking about the greatness of God, but then the verse continues and says, Their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. So what we see here in this one verse are three separate references to the joy and gladness that should be present in the lives of God's people. Their heart shall rejoice, their children shall see it and be glad, 
and their heart shall rejoice. And here's the key in the Lord. Amen. When we as saved people think about the goodness of God, when we as saved people think about the greatness of God, it says here, it should cause us to become glad. There's a song called When I Think About the Lord, and it says, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, Healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, he picked, how he picked me up, turned me around, put my feet on solid ground, and make me want to shout, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. When you think about the Lord, no matter what you're going through, it should give you joy. It should bring you gladness. God's vision is for his people to be glad people. Now, Disneyland is known as the happiest place on earth. But for a Christian, the church should be the happiest place we ever experience. And not just because you don't have to wait in long lines in 97 degree temperatures. Churches should be places where we are glad because we're meeting together with other people who supposedly are there also to think about the goodness and greatness of God. Psalm chapter 4, verse 7 says, Thou hast put gladness in my heart. Psalm 45, 15 with gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And they continually daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. You want to know how you can have more impact for God this year than you possibly ever had in your entire life? Try being happy. Try being glad. If you walk around angry and upset all the time, don't be surprised if you never lead anybody to the Lord. If you walk around miserable, all you do is complain and gossip at work, don't be surprised if you never lead a coworker to the Lord. If all you do is go home and gripe about what's going on in the family or what's going on in the world, don't be surprised if you never lead another single soul to the Lord. Oh yeah, that guy that's mean and angry all the time, please sign me up so I can go to get saved and I can go to his church and get a dose of what he's got. That lady who's always miserable and backbiting, gossiping, or please let me visit her church because she's obviously got something I want. That's how we act. We act a different way on Sunday than we do the rest of the week, and we never lead any people. Why? Because we're not truly glad people if it gets contained within the walls of the building. Think for just a minute of how many people in your day to day life friends, co workers, families, acquaintances, Think of how many people know that you're a Christian. How many people in your life that know you go to church? And how many of them might you be turning away from God or turning away from church simply because of the lousy <laughs> attitude you display every time you're around? Wow. Have you ever met a Christian with a bad attitude? I mean, I don't mean someone who had a bad day. We all have those moments where our testimony is what we want it to be. I'm talking about people that even as a Christian... Even other Christians don't really want to be around because they're sour, upset about something all the time. Let me remind you, being miserable is not a fruit of the Spirit. That's right. It's not in there. I've read it. I looked at the, I checked it again this morning just to make sure it's still not there. <laughs> being a spiritual tough guy who has to win every conversation is not a fruit of the Spirit. Being a, being a, a spiritual tough lady who's got to win every argument at work, it's not a fruit of the Spirit. God says that his people should be glad. They should be joyful. Their lives, when focused on God, it tells us it should produce gladness. Nobody wants to be around a dull or gloomy person. And here's the thing. Nobody wants to be part of a dull and gloomy church. That type of church is not going to grow. Right. Now, if we have a church with a full bunch of Eeyores in here, and goes, oh, woe is me. Nobody wants to be a part of that. Amen. If Eeyore is your spiritual animal, pick a different one. <laughs> Just as we saw earlier, people in churches that are not strong do not reflect the goodness and greatness of God. And people in churches that are not marked by gladness, here's the kicker, churches that are not marked by gladness will never make the impact that God wants to make. You see, the church is to be governed by God. The church is to reflect the goodness of God and the greatness of God. And we see that God's vision for his church is for his people to be glad. And finally, we see that God's vision for his church is to be growing. You know, we saw examples a while back when we looked at the 
early church in the book of Acts, and what we saw, how the church was growing both numerically and spiritually. And we see here in our, in our text, in verses 8 through 10, and verse 8 says, I will history them and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. All the previous points that we've looked at lead up to this point. A church that is governed by God. A church that reflects God's goodness. A church that reflects God's greatness. A church that is glad, it says here, will grow. Why? Healthy things grow. And let's say, if you're, if you're right here in 2020, the second Sunday of 2020, spiritually, if you're in the same place you were 2019 spiritually, let me tell you, you're not spiritually healthy. Right. If you're in the same place spiritually now as you were in 2000, you're not healthy. If you're in the same place you were in 1980, spiritually, you got saved and baptized and haven't grown. You know what? You're not healthy. And a church that is still in the same place they were spiritually 30 years ago is not healthy either. They're also declining in time. And that's not God's uh, will for us to grow. Or, sorry, it's not God's will for his people. That's not his, um, his will for us as a church collectively. God's word has clearly established God's vision for his church. And his vision for you personally as part of this church. When people look at you, do they see evidence of the goodness of God? Or do they just see someone who goes to church? Do they see someone whose life reflects the greatness of God? Or just someone who goes to church? Do they see someone who is angry or moody or irritable? Or do they see someone who is genuinely filled with their gladness produced from their relationship with Jesus Christ? When people think about your life, when people think about our church, what are we reflecting? Are we reflecting anything at all? Are we focused on promoting Grace Bible Baptist Church, or are we focused on exalting the Lord? If our focus is on our own routines or our own traditions, we're not focusing on exalting God. The things that we do, do we have a reason behind them that is spiritually focused? Are we lifting up ourselves, or are we lifting up God? In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Yes. God says, look, if you're exalting me, if you're exalting my goodness, if you're exalting my greatness, I will do the work. I will draw people to me. When you're focused on my glory, I will draw them to me. We need to make sure in our own lives, individually, and collectively as a church, that our focus is not on just drawing people to us. We need to make sure that our focus isn't on, isn't on drawing people to church. Our main focus should be drawing people to God. But as we reflect God's goodness and his greatness, when we honor God with our hearts and lives that reflect joy and gladness for what he's done for us, he says that his vision for his church to be governed, to display his goodness, to reflect it, demonstrate his, uh, his greatness, for his people to be glad, and for his people to be growing. Again, Ms. Janet Kilbourg, now as we prepare now for a time presentation.